Ladies and gentlemen, one of the most basic physical needs is food. No food, no survival. And for most of our history, food was scarce. Today, on the contrary, there is an overabundance of food. We don't think about it as we fill our carts in the supermarket, but from a world historical perspective, this is unique. So what has happened? The answer is, of course, technology. As a result of technology, for the first time in history, food is no longer scarce in most of the world. And when I say scarce, I use it in the common sense meaning of the word, referring to empty shops and empty stomachs. As a result, to argue that today scarcity of food is one of the most pressing and acute problems in the world would be a grave mistake. Like the proverbial generals, we would be taking a past war for a present war and remain blind to the real problem of today. The real problem is the opposite of that of the past. It is eating too much instead of too little. Our physical need is enough food, not too little, but neither too much. During most of mankind's history, the worry was to get enough. Now it is not to get too much. The right course is the middle way. We need to say goodbye to all that overabundance of food. If not by law, then at least by self-control and temperance. Now, food is a physical need. Could the same be the case with certain of our spiritual needs? Could we be waging a past war on this battlefront too? And should we be rather be looking the other way to spot the real enemy of today? During most of mankind's history, the fate of the individual was closely tied to the fate of the extended family. Without the protection and the assistance of this group, survival was impossible. Owing his life to the group, the group demanded the total commitment of the individual. Hence, the individual was submerged in the collectivity to such an extent that it is questionable if one can speak of individuals under such circumstances. The individual was nothing, the group was everything. Indeed, the patriarch himself of the group was not an individual in the full sense of the word, since departing from the group's customs was unsinkable for him too. Now, this submersion of the individual in the group was problematic from the beginning. The oldest books humankind possesses already tell us about the transgression of group norms by individuals. Apparently, there is something rebellious in human nature, something that makes us feel submersion as submission. There is a tendency in us to flee the demands of the group and instead follow the longings of our own individuality, of our own will, our own convictions. In short, there is a longing in us for individual freedom. This is where the city comes in. The city has always been a liberating entity, away from the family, the village, the countryside, where everyone knows each other and watches each other, where social control is suffocating, and everyone is expected to be exactly the same and act the same as everyone else. On to the city, where no one tells me what to do or even cares, where I have privacy, where I can be myself and do as I like. Stadtluft macht frei. This, ladies and gentlemen, is still our party pre. We favor everything that enhances individual freedom and individual choice. We oppose everything that smacks of the restriction of our individuality. The discourse of individual human rights, which has turned into something like a civil religion over the past three decades, is the foremost legal expression of this party pre. But it also lies behind widely shared moral values like tolerance and respect for difference. And it is the fundamental norm to all institutions of democratic government, including that of the city. Is such an absolutism justified? Or is it possible to have too much freedom and individual choice, just like one can have too much food? I know, this is shocking. No wonder, after all, freedom is the fundamental article of our faith. And what I am doing right now is questioning, questioning it to some extent. So, of course, it's shocking. 
about as shocking as questioning the divinity of the Quran or of Christ to those who believe in that. Let me remind you of something we all know deep down. The groups we are part of are not just a burden that blocks our individuality. They are also the foundation of our existence. Not just physically, but also spiritually. We need to be surrounded by people. We are gregarious animals, communitarians by nature. We cannot be happy without living in a community, preferably friendly, supportive, long-term and rather intimate. If we lack it, we are lonely. And loneliness is one of the most miserable feelings of all. It, it extinguishes all joie de vivre, all lust for life. Now, where do we find such embeddedness in history? Principally in the traditional village, consisting of several intertwined families. Precisely the surroundings fled from by the individual out of a need for freedom. Fled where to? To the city. Here we have come to the heart of the matter. City versus village, town versus country, individuality versus community. The debate is many centuries old. Urbs versus Rus was a hot topic already for the ancient Romans. The conservatives of all ages obviously prefer country, village, community. And the liberals, the city, the town, individuality. Both views are wrong, for both individuality and community are spiritual human needs. They conflict, that is true, but happiness is possible only if we can fulfill them both. The excess of individuality leads to loneliness, and the excess of community to the choking of the individual. So we need a middle way. We need a city consisting of villages. And do you know what? We used to have such cities consisting of little villages. The core notion here is neighborhood. These were the urban equivalent of villages. They were, so to speak, villages within the city. But we still have neighborhoods, don't we? Certainly, but most neighborhoods of today are very unlike that neighborhoods used to be. In former days, a neighborhood was a place where people knew each other quite well, where people watched over each other's kids on the street, where there were butchers and groceries and bakeries and all kinds of other shops where people did their shopping, where they bumped into each other and chit-chatted. The neighborhood of former days was a place where neighborly help was common and common activities were frequent, all of which and much more affected a strong social bond, a true living community. Now look at the neighborhoods of today. What you see is something very different. I myself live in the Vruchtenbuurt in The Hague. Not even half a century ago, this was proclaimed to be the homeliest neighborhood of the Netherlands. Today, virtually all the shops have disappeared. People now do their shopping in a big supermarket and in a big mall quite far away where they go by car. Or they just order what they need on the internet. There are no common activities. People in general have no ideas who their neighbors are. Hence, they don't even greet when they pass each other on the street. One lives there as a stranger among strangers. And this is not an exception. On the contrary, it's rather typical. Now, this is not a good development. Spiritual and physical security and comfort provided by the neighborhood is by and large gone. Many people feel unsafe. When they are in trouble or think they are in trouble, they call in the help of some public agency instead of their neighbors. And of course, it has, been predicted, it has predictably led to an enormous upsurge in loneliness and hence to feelings of depression, which are often caused or enhanced by loneliness. Why did this happen? Well, there are several causes, of course, but the most important, again, as in the case of food, is technology. More specifically, the motor car, the television, and the internet. As in the case of food, these technologies have changed life fundamentally. 
Take television. In the era before television, people sought entertainment and information from other people. So they went out into the street or invited people into their home. With the coming of television, both entertainment and information were readily available in the privacy of one's home. No need to go outside and mingle with the neighbors. Moreover, we are free to choose what we watch. The same goes for the car and the internet. All these technologies make us freer, more independent. They boost our individual choices. And hence, they kill community. Sure, they provide us with, with various kinds of virtual communities. But, as you know, these are meager substitutes for the real thing. Can we do something about it? Well, the city of Rotterdam has recently decided that to counter the loneliness among its citizens, its civil servants will visit every lonely person in town once a month. <laughs> that is clearly a very silly idea. The government is not a plumber firm that can fix all social problems. Only social institutions can fix social problems. What the government can and should do, however, is to help rebuild these social institutions that will fix these problems. In the case at hand, a community. Now, how does one rebuild communities in a city? How do we regain neighborhoods as they used to be? That is the question, and it is an urgent one. Let me end with a thought experiment. Suppose the citizens of a city at some point decide that they will no longer allow television, internet and cars. So they prohi prohibit them. Anyone who doesn't like it gets a large financial compensation and moves to another city. What would happen? Most people in town will probably sell their car. That will save them a lot of money. No insurance, no gasoline, no need to save or loan for a new car. But more importantly, children will be able to safely play on the streets again. The motorways will be transformed into walkways and bikeways. Public transportation, tram and train, will improve a lot since it will have more customers. The air will clean up. And small shops will return to the streets because it will have become impossible to go do your shopping once a week by car in a supermarket or mall far away. True, these shops around the corner in walking or biking distance will be somewhat more expensive than the supermarket. But remember that everyone saves a lot by having no car. The chit-chatting will return. People will get to know each other again. Also, there is no television or internet, so entertainment has to be sought elsewhere. Well, since people have no car, they will have to find entertainment in the, in the neighborhood. So they will go to a club to their liking, a sports club perhaps, or a bingo club, or a book club. Yes, a book club, since books will, be, be, will begin to be read again. Many new clubs and other social gatherings will come into existence, where people will meet and come to know each other. And thus, the social bond that was lost will be quickly re-established. People will again look out after each other and each other's children. And they will feel safe again and included in a community. Loneliness will be a thing of the past. In some, their happiness will increase quite a bit. Now, people in the other cities, those with cars, televisions and the internet, will hear of this city that has said goodbye to all that overabundance of technology. What will they do? How will they react? Don't you think that many people will want to move to this city? Or that they will pressure their own city to copy its rules? Thank you very much. Thank you.